Okay, we're back. We're live. It's Monday. Wow, Monday. Ooh, yeah, Monday. Love Mondays. <laughs> Research in Manoa. Uh, thank you, Talia Ogliori, for setting up our show as she does from the University of the Chancellor's Office. And uh, today we have um, Nicole Lautsey. Uh, she is with the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, but mostly the geophysics part, right? Right. <laughs> Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Are you a PhD? Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and the title of our show is, How Hot Is Your Hawaii? I guess I say, why, why would you name a show that name? Tali actually came up with the title, which is a great title, but largely because most of my research uh, currently is focused on geothermal in the state of Hawaii. Okay, so. and wh wh what is your training in and what research are you involved in? My training is in volcanology. So I got my undergraduate degree in geology, my PhD from UH in geology and geophysics, um, what I studied was physical volcanology. Then I did a number of postdocs, mostly related to volcanology. For the past three years, I've been focused on geothermal, working closely with Don Thomas, in part because c getting funding to continue to do volcanology has been challenging the past several years. Yes. There are not that many people who do volcanology around here, is there are. There's, oh. a, there's a few volcanologists at the University uh, of Hawaii, and then there's, of course, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory on the Big Island, oh. where there's volcano yeah, specialists. That'd, that'd be the center, the, the field work, as it were. Right. And, and the problem is that, you know, Dr. Spock recently died. Right. So there's one less, <laughs> I suppose, now. Less volcanologists. <laughs> That's just a joke. Okay, and uh, shout out to Don Thomas, because we never talk about ge geothermal without talking to Don. Thank like, you. Or Don. groundwater, yes. Or groundwater. Don is the guru. Okay, hi, Don. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get serious here. Um, you're talking today about groundwater and geothermal. Why are they related? For geothermal, which has been the focus of my work for the past few years, you need a fluid to bring the heat to the surface. So that fluid is, is typically water. And also because the groundwater can host indicators of a geothermal resource in the subsurface. So the temperature and the chemistry of groundwater is one thing we look at when we're trying to assess whether or not there's a geothermal resource. But you don't walk around measuring it. The DLNR measures it when a well is dug. Is that what happens? The temperature of the water is something that is recorded when the well is dug, which the DLNR permits and regulates, correct, yeah. And so, then a host of agencies look at the groundwater chemistry, so Department of Health is one, the Boards of Water Supply are another, and the geochemistry of the groundwater can also tell us something about whether or not there's a magmatic heat source uh, which will affect the chemistry of the water. Digging wells is different now than it used to be, eh? Sure. Don, Don could speak to that better than me, but yeah. I suppose there was a time in the outback, I'm thinking of the Big Island especially, you dug a well, and that's that. Now you dig a well, the government is with you in every, in every way. Correct, yeah. So what's the, what's the right temperature for groundwater? I mean, potable groundwater. I don't know that there's a right temperature for potable groundwater. But anything that's an elevated temperature is something that we would consider relevant to looking for a geothermal resource. And that temperature will vary with location because it depends on the amount of um, uh, recharge, so rainfall and types of things. So when, when, when DLNR reports a new well and they report the temperature of the water coming out of the well, you, you get a telex or something. No. You get a message that tells you, whoops, new well temperature. Not at all. How does that it's work? a lot more challenging than that. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's one thing that we'd like to change in the future in the electronic age to make it so that uh, data comes in in a little bit more of a systematic fashion. But no, one, one of the main things that I've done over the past three years is try and compile a bunch of information that was not digital, make it digital, and that was part of this website that I think we'll talk about, um, bringing that information into digital format and putting it in a platform that the public could access or the state agencies could access or any potential developer could access. Okay, we're going to go to that after the break. But yeah, sure. For now, I just want to set the stage. So, okay, so you're looking at the temperature of the, of the water and you're getting the data as you can. I mean, probably in the future, we'll see better, easier ways to get the data. Sure. Um, but what do you do with that? What do you do with, uh, I mean, making models? Are you making computer yeah. models? Uh, well, one of my main projects right now is to integrate all data relevant to geothermal statewide. So there's a lot more than just the water data that we're trying to integrate. And then do some probability statistics to try and identify highest potential 
resource areas across the state. Um, resource, you mean geothermal? Geothermal, resource? yeah, exactly. Okay, so the water is telling us if it's hot down there. And then by modeling that, we can tell whether there's a probability of geothermal down there. That's one, one data set. So the temperature of the water and the chemistry of the water are two independent data sets that we're using to integrate into this overall probability model. Yeah. Okay. This is great. It's like, you know, like digging for oil, isn't it? It is. It's actually, so th this funding actually comes from the Department of Energy, and they took the concept from the oil and gas industry to do this probability statistics, to look at all data that could be relevant to a resource, whether that be oil and gas or geothermal. But Nicole, let me ask you, I mean, if they took this approach from, from oil, why don't they take all the other approaches from oil, too? You know, there's a million ways they could find. I mean, oil finding is raised to a science and an art. It's amazing what they can do now anywhere. They find oil when it's of stone, they find oil. So why don't we use that technology, too? I think a lot of that is proprietary, so we don't know a lot of what they're doing. And the oil and gas industry has a lot more money than we academics have. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Fair yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah. But let me say, if money were no object, and if these oil companies were cooperative, it sounds like you and I would agree that we could find geothermal a lot easier. I'm not sure about that. I don't know what methods they use that we're not aware of. Um, and what they're looking for is very different. So the data that they're going to integrate for their to look for oil and gas is much different than what we're looking at, so. Yeah, well, let me, let me just make some guesses then. If you want to find oil, you look for certain rock configurations down there and, and void configurations, you know. I know they do that with gas, I mean, because you have to have a void. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have gas, that has to be a void of rock. Um, so query, um, when you're looking for uh, geothermal, are you looking for a void also? Are you looking for something which isn't rock? and maybe some kind of radar or, you know, explosive, uh, you know, reaction kind of thing where the, where the signals are coming up from an explosion. Maybe that would tell you where the, the voids were? We're not looking for a void per se. We're looking for rock, hot rock that is saturated with hot water, essentially, okay. or hot fluids. Right. And yeah, we use passive geophysical techniques on the surface of the Earth to try and under, to, to look at actually the density of the rock and the resistivity. So resistivity is the opposite of conductivity. As the rock exists on the surface. You look right there on the surface. You look on the surface, but what these techniques do is image the subsurface up to kilometers to tens of kilometers deep, actually. So what we're doing is getting a picture of what's in the subsurface using these passive, passive geophysical methods on that? the surface. How do you do that? Yeah. Uh, you know, so I'm not a geophysicist, I'm a geologist, but I'm working with geophysicists who lead these operations, and we have funding to actively do such surveys, and we are doing them. Um, so there's, there's one called magnetotellurics, and magnetotellurics can image the resistivity of rock to tens of kilometers deep. And so what we're looking for is, um, so the, the, the rock resistivity will change when it hosts water, it becomes more conductive. When it hosts hot water, it becomes even more conductive or salt water, it becomes conductive. So we can often see when there's a transition from unsaturated rock to saturated rock. And that, and then it actually, so temperature is another effect. When that water is hot, the resistivity goes down. So we're looking for conductive layers in the subsurface. And what you do is you bury these little antennas and coils just below the ground surface um, and leave them there for a number of days. And you have a couple of, not couple, but tens of survey sites over tens of kilometers, say. And you get the data, and you do fancy math on the data and it gives you an, a 2 or 3D image of what's in the subsurface. How do the coils work? It's electromagnetic? Is that what? Yeah. What are they reading exactly? They are reading the mag <laughs> magne magnetic and telluric waves that, okay. that are naturally the in the Earth. The Earth's magnetism. Yeah, exactly. So, and that's a, so it's a very passive technique. It's not inducing any energy. It's, it's, it, it exists in the Earth due to you know, solar flare interaction so with the mag... non-invasive. Yeah, very non-invasive, <laughs> yes. I guess there's a lot of people who like that. Don't 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 well, dig a hole in in Pelly's breast, you know. Exactly. Well, it's what we it's it's much less expensive than drilling and less invasive than drilling. So yes, it's it's good all around. I think so. Well, it sounds like the end product of this, or at least one of the products, is to find out where the geothermal is. Yeah, to find out where so heat that's is. That's simple. Yeah. Well, if you find heat, you find you find a resource. Yeah. Yeah. Ideally. Yeah. Ideally. And the gravity I can talk about briefly. So the gravity Please. surveys talk about 
or sh tell the density of rock in the subsurface. And so we're looking for dense rock, which could be indicative of magma that solidified before reaching the surface, since that's our source of heat here in Hawaii. Even though it's not hot at the moment. Well, we want it to be hot at the moment or residual heat. So it takes a very long time for rock to cool in the subsurface. So but if it was intruded hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of years ago, there hot. may still be heat, residual heat. And, yeah. I mean, right, if I'm guessing all this stuff, but the, the deeper you get, the more compressed it is, and therefore the hotter, or the longer it stays hot. It would stay hot, yeah. It would be more insulated. So deeper. how do you find out the temperature of the rock way down, say, five kilometers, ten kilometers? To more? actual ground truth, you need to drill. So the yeah. end product is always drilling. But thing. drilling is very expensive, so, and requires all this permitting, as you were talking about. So we oh, try yeah. to figure out, before we choose a drilling site, we try to get as much information as we can <laughs> prior to drilling. Complicated. And yeah, the slim hole. So we've started with the slim hole. What's, One of Don's projects hole? is three, three inches. Inch, three inches. Yeah, three to five inches, I think. So oh. you have to start wider and telescope down. Well, well, OK, OK. So but what, when you have a real geothermal facility, I mean, actually pumping geo. Production well, that's Producing called. geothermal, that would be a lot wider, eh? Be a lot wider, but not as wide as you might think. I actually don't know the diameter of pr typical production well. Yeah. I remember going to a, oh yeah, it was, it was really interesting. I remember going to a, a class that was at Lanai High School. Wow. And they were asking the kids how wide do they think the undersea cable would be? You know, I mean, and nobody really knew. <laughs> These kids, you know, were like this, you know. But in fact, you know, when the sea cable is that big. It was quite small, you know, yeah. The same thing here. You yeah. Know, it's just gas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so the idea is with these various m modeled data, you, you are trying to make a map of the whole state, of the, the, the land mass of the state anyway. Yeah and find out where the geothermal resource might be. And this, you're doing this because the federal government has given you money to do it, um, and presumably, therefore, wants you to learn this information, right? Correct, yeah. So the map will show the probability. Our goal is to have a probability, so high probability areas based on the data that we have, and low probability areas, and or areas where we hope to get more data, where we, we're not sure because we lack the data, so we'll, let's go get more data. Um, and that would be phase two of the same project. So in October, this one project is supposed to end, and then phase two would be to go out and do more exploration. So it would be these types of surveys I've talked about or getting more of the water data. How long has it been going on? Just since last October, this, give, this, this so specific project. So this is moving project. quickly, then. It is. Yeah, we have no choice. Why? Yeah. why? Is, there, is there a fuse on this thing? Uh, well, this specific grant was divided up into three-year phases, and it's going to be awarded in phases. So phase one of the specific grant. So you have to finish by the end of the first phase if you want to go on to the second exactly. phase. Exactly. And not everybody who got phase one is going to get phase two. So we need to do a good job in phase one. Yeah. OK, are you, now are you doing the modeling? I'm not leading. I'm leading this specific project. I, yeah, I'm the principal investigator, so I'm leading the organization of it, but no, we have two team members that are more of the new, have the numerical background to do the, the statistical analysis. Well, that's computer work, and, and what, are they using uh, Dr. Lasner's uh, fancy computer center, or they got a, a little PC <laughs> under the desk? So far, we're not using any type of supercomputing, but it has been discussed as a possibility, so yeah. And at the end, what, what's the software? Is it special proprietary software, or is it no. something I can buy online, or what? So we're, we're compiling all the data into GIS, which I'm sure you've heard of, and then... GIS stands for? Geographic Information System. I knew that. I believe. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay. um, so that's a nice, a very nice program where you can look at maps. So you can geospatially orient your data. You give each data set a Latin longitude, and you can have multiple layers. So we've got 10 or 15 data layers right now. So you can turn layers on and off and look at things differently. And we're exporting that data um, to the professor who's doing our lead modeling, and he's doing the modeling in MATLAB, which is Not just MATLAB. Ma can you spell that? M-A-T-L-A-B. 
MATLAB. MATLAB. Don't, it, don't try it, that at home. It's just another program. Is that that, right? no, no big deal. Yeah. It's not a big deal to those the programmers who know how to use it. Yeah. And you put it in data, like with a spreadsheet of data or a, da you can a read in, yeah. data file, and, and, and the thing reads it, and it's like creating a chart, you know, on, mm -hmm. on, 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 on a spreadsheet. <laughs> And, and the chart has to be very sophisticated, though. Right. And, and it, you put the data in, and you have to put the location where you got the data, I suppose. The, the... For example, water temperature. Right. From a well. You have to put the exact coordinates of the well in. Yeah. So it can read it ge geographically. Yes. OK. So how is the chart doing? I mean, how's the GIS doing? Good. Yeah, we're actually the end of this month is the end of quarter two, so we have to divide the project into quarters, and we think we are like ninety five percent done with the data compilation and ninety eight percent have it all into into GIS, and so we're transitioning right now to the modeling aspect of it, and focusing. We have the most data related to geothermal on the Big Island, so we're starting with the modeling on the Big Island, and the challenge is to you know we don't have complete data for the whole state kind of thing, so. How do we come up with this comprehensive model that's going to equate all area equally when we don't have equal data? So, okay, it's a challenge. Like, yeah, I, how do you do that? It's a challenge. Um, you have to compensate somehow, or yeah. average. Yeah. So I, I think how they're developing the model is that how to explain it. If if no data exists, it's not a thumbs down kind of thing. It's just neutral. So we're going to wait weight each data set according to the probability of the data indicating that it tells that there's a resource present. And then when there's no data, I mean, so say it's, we're going to probably do the probability on a color scale where red is hot and blue is cold. Mm -hmm. And where data is missing, it'll just be the middle of that, whatever that is. Between I, red, it's an yeah. average, it's an average. Yeah, it's an average. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, but the interpretation of the data and making it red or yellow or whatever it is, that's an algorithm that somebody has to write. Mm -hmm. Who, who's writing that? The, the two, two professors leading the mathematical aspect of this project are Garrett Ito, who's a geophysicist, and Neil Fraser, um, who are in geology and geophysics at the University of Hawaii, and they're very good. And they are getting expert elicitation, largely from Don Thomas. I knew that you were yeah. going to say that. <laughs> Okay, well, so Dawn I'm, says, okay, this this data says, yeah, like that's a high <laughs> probability that there's a resource there versus this data, which is uh, something to consider, but you know, not very telling. So, <laughs> and on the mention of Don Thomas's name, we're going to need to take a break. Okay, that's Nicole Lautsey. Uh, she's with the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa, which is part of SoWest. Yes, it is part yeah. of SoWest, the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. Uh, here on Research in Manoa, and we're talking about how hot is your Hawaii. We'll be back. We're going to explore more. We're going to dig deeper. You'll see. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Aloha, my name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ, and my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com. We have live guests in studio, and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the island. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Nicole Lautzer, Lautze, uh, of the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at SoWest. Talk about how, how hot is your Hawaii. And I guess, um, I guess I'm learning about this, but that means how hot is the land and the water on which we are walking around? The whole state. How sure. Hot? Yeah. 
And to, just to clarify, there is no relationship, at least not obvious, between the temperature of the water from the groundwater and, and climate change, the temperature of the sea. Um, yeah, so I think that the, the climate change impact to the temperature of our groundwater would be more of a secondary effect in that part, the temperature of the groundwater is related to, to a lot of factors, including the amount of rainfall we get, which is going to be impacted by climate change. And yeah, the, the level of seawater, which influences where our fresh water is to some extent. So as sea level rises because of climate change, that's going to impact our fresh water systems as well. Yeah, I'm thinking but, of all that business with the lens. Yeah. Uh, and if, if the lens goes bad because, you know, seawater is hot seawater or warmer seawater Warm, yeah. creeping into the fresh water supply and doing bad things to the lens in the, near the yeah. aquifer. Then, then there would be an effect of some kind. Of yeah. some kind, yeah. And, and also, the lens is driven by the density difference between freshwater and seawater. And if the temperature of the seawater changes, it's going to affect the density of the seawater. So that's going to impact the lens as well. Both ways. Yeah. So it's a sort of a, an intersection there. And a change in either side of the intersection changes the intersection. Right. You could quote me on yeah. that. Yeah. And so the groundwater, g groundwater is sort of a. Uh, not something that I've worked specifically on very much, but we're going to seek funding to, to do more work on groundwater because with increasing populations, especially on this island and climate change, it's really important that we monitor our groundwater systems. Well, you know, just, just a I mean, completely um, unscientific um, thought is that um, if, if the groundwater is warmer, then more microbes can grow in it as so many other micro microbial risks from climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're taking your drinking water from this water that we are talking about, and this water is a little warmer, and it has exposure to microbes, pathogens of some kind, um, you know, then we're, we're at the wrong end of that barrel. <laughs> right. And we yeah. don't exactly know what's, well, I guess we know what's in there, but, but we don't know what happens to that uh, because of temperature change. Sure, yeah. yeah. But you're not looking at that. That's just a. That could be one point. component of a project or a proposal we're, we're thinking of submitting to, towards the end of this year. So yeah, it is it is related to, okay. to things we're talking about. Okay. So yeah. I, I'm sort of getting the idea that you do groundwater in all capacities because you're a geologist. Sure. I I do groundwater tangentially to to geothermal essentially right now um, but I'm learning more about more and more about groundwater so sort of my, my sort of career has gone from volcanology which is fascinating and fun in very relevant and specific locations where there's active volcanoes to this more practical and applied science yeah. which there is funding for <laughs> yeah. in today's world because we need to pay attention to these kinds of things. Yeah. Did you think of the paper about how the front page I think it was this morning how people in Pune can relax now because fear dissipates I thought it was an incredible uh, headline. Fear dissipates. Is that what we make headlines with? Um, so fear is this. Is that, is that an accurate kind of uh, feel-good uh, phenomenon that uh, is happening? Fear there? of what? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, they, were afraid, they were afraid of losing their homes. Oh, because of the lava flow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, there's, what is it, sociological? studies on, and this is something that I, I kind of work on tangentially too with volcanoes, where uh, people that have a higher frequency of dealing with disaster are more likely to take mitigation risks, so to protect themselves from them. But these hazards that are spaced widely apart, or yeah, disasters that are spread widely apart, people become less resilient to dealing with the disaster. So if that might be related to what the article's talking about? Yeah, it could, could be something like that. Yeah. So they were worried before, they're not so worried now. They're back to normalcy, if you will. Yeah. Um, no. Until the next lava Until flow next starts. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and I think we can, not, not to say that lava flows are related to climate change, although who knows. <laughs> well, but we're going to have more natural phenomena knocking at our door in the years to come, for sure. Yeah. If it's not one thing, it's another. So let's, let's go back to uh, water and geothermal, though. So this is all directed at finding the geothermal. What, I mean, I know we don't have the, the map ready yet, but w what, what do you perceive is going to happen here? You said before that there's a possibility of geothermal on every island in our state. 
Yeah, that's something that kind of shocked me when I started working on the geothermal. So Dawn was part of the last real, in my opinion, statewide resource assessment, as in we're going to go out and get new data and try and figure this out. Um, which took place in the late 70s, and those results were published in the early 80s, and found some indicators of a, of a geothermal resource on all islands. So like Kauai, it was heat, uh, uh, sorry, some warm water. And on this island, there was some anomalous geochemistry in water wells. Uh, that, means, that means the kind of chemicals you would find in geothermal yeah. is in the water. Yeah. So that, okay, that, that suggests geothermal. A potent, yeah, it's, it yeah. gives a probability that there's a resource, so maybe we should look into it further. Yeah. Uh, and very little work has been done since that time, apart from maybe the last five years. So we really don't know, and I think, you know, just basic responsibility of the state, of, of us living here, would be to assess the resource. So what's going to happen, I don't really know. But what I'm trying to be a part of with Dawn is to do a, an updated resource assessment, because we have these modern technologies that are relatively inexpensive and non-invasive. <laughs> and so let's figure out what we have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but that would, I mean, to me, that would go for the proposition is that we could use geothermal in some way. Uh, and I mentioned to you before that, you know, politically, it didn't look real good for undersea cable to move electrical energy from a geothermal area to a non-geothermal area, uh, you know, you get into the question of, well, we don't have to worry about that if all the areas are geothermal. <laughs> well, the high, we know the, the one proven resource we say is on the Big Island, and that's Puna Geothermal Venture, which is providing 20% plus or minus of the Big Island's energy from geothermal. I mean, that's, that's located in what I would say is one of the most obvious locations to find heat Near in the, the state, volcano. near yeah. the volcano, along the most active rift zone of Kilauea Volcano, which is erupting and has been continuously erupting since 1983, right? Yeah. Um, but to look outside of Puna is something that I think is responsible to do, and that's what we're starting to do. Well, I mean... And just to mention, the undersea cable, now there's new technology from when there was a trial undersea cable, which was in the 70s, I think, in the state. Here? Here, yeah. I didn't know they had. Yeah, they I had. They would talk about it, but I don't know if they actually had. They it, they know. laid a test cable, and Don could speak to this again better than I could. Between Big Island and Maui, I believe, laid it down, picked it up, laid it back down. Wow. I think is what he says, wow. and it showed that it functioned and wow. it, they could do it. Yeah. But then there was never any energy transmitted along the cable, and other Iceland is doing that. Iceland has underwater cable to other countries where oh. energy is being transmitted. So the technology exists in the world to do such a thing. So whether we find a high, high temperature resource that could provide a lot of energy, for example, on this island, is an open question. The probability, Don would say, I think is low. But if we find even a low temperature resource which provides some energy, we would develop it here yeah. because our energy demand is so high. Yeah. And, and you know, per uh, our discussion earlier, um, or, uh, or, what's his name? Ormat. Ormat, yeah. Orm, yeah. which is the uh, well, it's a public company now out of Denver, I think. Used to be uh, owned by an Israeli engineer, yeah. but I think they made, made it Did a public, public company. Okay. And they have facilities everywhere. Right. And they're really good at it. And if they were to build a new geothermal facility, say on the Big Island or anywhere in the islands, it would be far more advanced than the one that exists at Pune today. Uh, arguably, they should change that out anyway. But <clears throat> point is that even if um, we, we don't have the same quality of geothermal, say, in Oahu, mm -hmm. with new technology, we might be more efficient in using, finding it and using it and, you know, developing it. And in that case, you don't have to have this, you know, luxury of, uh, you know, this, you know, huge resource in Puna right. in, in Oahu. And, and that may be coming, who knows? Right. Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah. So, I mean, theoretically, uh, you know, people always say, maybe you have an idea, people always say, oh, geothermal is not forever because you theoretically can use it up, but it's for hundreds or thousands of years. Um, I think that, the, yeah, I, well, I shouldn't say this, but I think that the typical lifespan of a geothermal facility is definitely decades. And I don't know that we've had any technology a, for a century, you know, so... Yeah, no, as long as it's done, my understanding is as long as it's the development of the resource is done responsibly, so you need an injection well, so you re-inject re the fluid that is being extracted back into the earth, so it's the same fluid that you're taking out 
all that you're so, so. removing from the fluid is heat and putting the same fluid black down so that there's fluid in the subsurface, it can go on indefinitely. And so at the end of a given period of time, it's the same. It's yeah. just, you've just extracted the heat, that's mm -hmm. all. And the chemical composition of what's down there is the same as when you started. Right. Oh, that's very environmental, isn't it? It is, yeah. Oh. I mean, right now, wow, that'd be terrific. So, I mean, so this is the big deal because if you could mine the geothermal in an environmentally safe and, um, you know, non-invasive way, relatively speaking, and if you could do it efficiently, even in an island which doesn't have as much as the, you know, Puna, Puna area does, then you could have geothermal everywhere in the state, theoretically. Theoretically, there is that potential, yes. So that that's part of your... Your, as part of your thing here. Yeah, I think it's really exciting. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, okay, the screenshot. Let's look at the website. And uh, this is the website. Okay, there it is. Now tell us about this new website for your new, we're going to call it new group, which is the Hawaii Groundwater and Geothermal Resource Center. What do we got going? Yeah, so this is essentially... Um, Don and I had several projects related to geothermal and groundwater focused in Hawaii, and I had a team of students kind of working for me, and they said we should give ourselves a name. So we'd have these team meetings, and they said, why don't we give ourselves a name? And I thought that was a great idea, as did Don, as is the director of HIGP. So this is the name that we came up with. And what I had wanted to do for some time is bring together a platform from which we could present to the public, to any interested party, the work that we're doing. Because I think maybe a lot of the issues about geothermal being contentious or controversial are that the information is not available. So I think transparency in general is a good idea. And yeah. there's nothing, we're happy to provide anyone the data that we're working with or that we're working on. And how I started working with Don was on a project that Department of Energy funded to digitize everything related to geothermal that was not in digital format. So that was, again, this what team of that? students. What data would that be? Anything, any exploration that was done like in the 70s and 80s, pre-computer era, and at DOE, this was a national project that Department of Energy funded. I think because they thought, you know, within the computer age, a lot of that data was going to go missing, and it would be less expensive to pay to get it digitized and put it in a hub for developers, anyone to access, than to throw it away, sure. right? And so Don got that contract for the state of Hawaii in a kind of hired me on to, to do it, <laughs> to manage it. Um, and so a lot of what we have on this website is historical, is that historical data. But there was also Don's big drilling project. So this is a picture of, of the drilling team and some scientists um, in the saddle road on the big island. And there was almost a daily drilling report written by Eric Haskins, who's in one, of the, one of the people in the photo there, that was hosted on a blogspot.com. And I said, why don't we put that on a university website? Because people were accessing the blogspot. So anyway, there was a lot of information kind of in disparate locations. And I thought, with the team of students, why don't we try and put it in an, one spot that people can access? And then this will also be a platform as we continue to work on these issues that we can put all of our stuff, and people would know to go there to access it. So essentially, that came together with myself and a team of two students who we didn't really know what we were doing, but we're pretty happy with the results. So there's, um, there's programs out there. Ethan Kastner was, is, is the IT guy, and Cheryl Ishii is a student who is a fashion design major, and I had her design the logo, which we're happy with. <laughs> um, do kind of the layout of the, the, layout of the website. With e oh, that's which, a great picture. Yeah, so, so right now it's hosting four main projects. And as we continue to compile data, we'll, I hope, I'm going to work with Cyber Infrastructure Department and who know a lot more about putting together platforms to host data than I do, so that as we bring this data together, we can put it on there for, for people to access. Okay, so you, whatever data you can get on and anything related, you're going to put on this website. But what's the, and it's going to evolve, of course. Website, a website yeah. like this evolves with the data, you know, it's, it's driven by the data. Right. Um, what, what do you see it evolving to? I mean, is it going to be the kind of website where if I'm a, a Wall Street banker and I'm uh, trying to fund, uh, uh, say, a geothermal facility in Maui, for example, this could happen soon, um, and I want to know, I want to, with my own eyes, I want to see the probability, I want to see, you know, how your algorithm works on what data you have. 
I can go to the website and see that. I can take that off and decide for myself what the probability is um, of success of finding a well, say, in Maui somewhere. I, yes, I guess ideally we'd have all the information available. I think that what step one that we'd like to do, for example, this GIS, where we're compiling all the data right now into GIS layers, I'd like to figure out a platform so that somebody could see a state of Hawaii, draw a little triangle on the area they're inter triangle, rectangle on the area that they're interested in and see what data is available in that area and download that data to do their own probability statistics on and, and you're should open they to want. That. That's, that's true scientific collaboration yeah. and transparency. That is. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's UH. Yay. Yeah. Yay, that, yeah. UH. <laughs> <laughs> that is good, yeah. I think that I mean a lot of what we're doing I think should be provided to the developers. So you know I don't think we as a university are ever going to develop the resource. That's not our job. But to no. assess the resource is our job. To compile the data and hand it over to the state so that they can do what they want with it, the state agencies, and then to developers should they want to develop the resource so and manage. So we well, I, you know, I, I don't know if this is part of your, mm, you know, thought process, but uh, there's, there's the competition of other um, renewable energies. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not only, you know, the, the cost at the, at the wellhead, but the, the cost of transporting it, the cost of dealing with it, and I suppose the social cost of arguing with people to the extent they want to oppose it. And I wonder where you, know, where you see, I mean, I can take you down my thoughts on this, uh, geothermal and this mission and this whole idea about finding it and making it available to developers who might want to you know, remake our, our, our clean energy program. Um, but you know, you gotta compete with, uh, an, an industry of solar guys who make plenty of money doing solar right. and who are all over the legislature every day right. trying to get solar incentives. You know. Yeah. So I'd like to view it not as a competition. Um, maybe that's idealistic. But we, geothermal industry likes to say it's the only baseload energy source. So whereas solar will fluctuate day to night and these types of things, geothermal is the only as far as I know, the only renewable energy that is reliable for the utility company to deal with. So they know what megawatt or kilowatt is going to be 24-7 and that's not going to fluctuate. So Don tells a story where um, so I think it was a Higo executive told him that they were burning more fuel trying to follow the demand of a wind turbine or the output of a wind turbine mm. than they would have because it was so inconsistent that it's hard for the utility company to deal with matching the demand and supply of the population and the, which fluctuates and the fluctuating supply from fluctuating renewable energy sources. And so that's not an issue with geothermal. It's a perfect generator. Yeah, it's a perfect you, you, generator. You turn the switch and there it is at any level you want. Right. It's pretty good. Yeah. But nothing else is like that. Nothing else is like that. I don't think there's any other renewable energy that's like that. And so geothermal is, is a very consistent and very reliable renewable energy source for that reason. And of course, development has some impact on the environment, but it's so small. There was actually another colleague who showed a, a picture of a solar farm basically with tons of solar panels out to capture that energy versus which is located in the desert in Nevada I think versus the land mass or the land acreage taken up by a geothermal power plant and they're actually very small relative to some the of the other geothermal the geothermal sure yeah all you need is whatever it was it's yeah not, not a, very much. <laughs> a production well in, in theory a production well and an injection well and then some turbines to, you know, transfer the energy. Yeah, so I mean, uh, even even Pune, it's not that big it's, a facility. Right, it's and not that big That's the old technology. Right. And I'm sure the new technology takes e even less. You know, um, Rick Rochelo and uh, HNEI mm -hmm. uh, were working on a project in Pune uh, on hydrogen. And we're trying to do an electrolyzer and um, convert the geothermal to hydrogen and put them in those fiber tanks so that they could be moved around, you know, the state. Uh, fungible tanks, you know, a standard size, and put them on a barge and take them anywhere and, and uh, you know, high, high compression, um, and use them as a, an energy source, the straight off geothermal in any way. So have you, any thoughts about that? I mean, should we be thinking about that as, a, as an alternative to the undersea cable? 
I'm not familiar with that at all. Sorry. So okay, I don't. Well, you're yeah. a scientist. So. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. I mean, yeah. why, why should people in general right now in the circumstance of our clean energy initiative care about the, the, the uh, temperature of groundwater and its relation to geothermal? Why should he, he's right behind that camera and he wants to know why should he oh. care? Why should he care? <laughs> Well, yeah, as we were talking about, I, I mean, everybody cares about groundwater that wants water coming out of their faucet or that wants water to drink. So monitoring the groundwater is almost, a no, is, is almost a no brainer, right? Yeah, yeah. Geothermal is a very responsible way, in my opinion, to gain energy. And, and you know, it's funny because as I've been traveling, people will say, you know, you live in Hawaii. Why isn't Hawaii more geothermal? Because we're a volcanic island state, right? We're entirely volcanic, which is not as simple as that. That doesn't mean we can drill a hole anywhere and find heat. So it's not it's not quite that simple. But the fact that we don't even know what our re geothermal resources are is a good question. I think it's a great yes, question. Yes, right. It's a great question. Um, that we should have an answer to. So we, we should know what we have. <laughs> yeah. So let's try to change that. Um, so why, I mean, why does anyone care? I mean, it's socially or environmentally, I think, responsible for anyone living on this planet to care about energy in today's climate, with climate change and growing population and everything else going on. What Hawaii is doing is not quite the most responsible um, by bringing imported oil or oil, imported or not oil, but shipping it. So obtaining the oil elsewhere is almost exporting Sure. So yes, you're sending money overseas. Yeah, you're exporting the money that, and all the you know the, spoils the environmental the environment. yeah. issues associated with developing oil. We're not having to deal with, but we're causing still by using the oil here. Um, so I mean, it would be a much more responsible. So so in a sort of global climate, it's not a responsible way that we're living now. We also pay extremely high energy prices, three to four times higher than the national average, which Joe Public would care about, right? Because it's money coming out of their pocket. And, and another thing I'm not sure if people realize in the state is that geothermal is characterized as a mineral resource, and the state collects royalties from any geothermal production. Yes. So ORMAT is paying DLNR right now yes. for their output. Yes. Substantial of geothermal, money. And it's substantial money. I, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what per kilowatt out it is, but it's substantial money that DLNR is getting right now to work on state issues. It's like a tax. Yeah, it is. So the more geothermal we develop, the more the state money the state will have, yeah. which is good for the state. Yeah. Apart from, actually, we have one project Don, that Dawn is leading to do the magnetotelluric surveys on DHHL land in the saddle. And royalties from geothermal developed on DHHL land will go straight to DHHL. So that's a good for them as well. So. You've got to know what we have. It's, right. it's worth it to know what we have. And, and then we can consider our options. It's really important we have this information. Uh, Nicole Lautze of the Hawaii Institute for Geophysics and Planetology uh, here on Research in Manoa. How hot is our Hawaii? Uh -huh. We'll be studying this more as we go forward. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks. Aloha. Oops, Aloha. <laughs>